Welcome everyone to the uh, August 15th meeting of the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara. I'm Judy Flattery. I'm the president of the society this year. So welcome everyone. Our talk this afternoon is called Examining Wu, featuring Bruce Gleason. Examining Wu is a presentation about all things magical, mystical, and absolutely totally useless. Bruce will scrutinize many common non-scientific medical procedures, religion-based infomercial scams, homeopathy, genetically modified organisms, and gay conversion therapy. He will discuss how to tell what is more likely to be true and will examine the psychology of conspiracy theorists he will also review why our species is so susceptible to confirmation bias and so often comfortable with cognitive dissonance. And I always like to take a look at why is this topic of interest to humanists? So I go back to Paul Kurtz wrote the affirmations of humanism, a statement of principles, and two of them really seem to apply to the topic of woo. One is that we are skeptical of untested claims to knowledge, and we are open to novel ideas and seek new departures in our thinking. And also we're committed to the application of reason and science to the understanding of the universe and to the solving of human problems. So it seems a talk on Wu is perfectly appropriate for humanist audience. So who is Bruce? Bruce Gleason has been involved in the atheist, skeptic, and humanist communities for 16 years. Founder of the Backyard Skeptics Meetup with over 1,300 members, he has placed over 14 billboards supporting the secular community. He creates two annual conferences, Logical LA, which is a scientific skeptics event, and the Free Thought Alliance Conference, which is for atheists, agnostics, and church state separatists. Both conferences, unfortunately, are postponed due to COVID-19. Bruce is a professional videographer and supplies critical AV, audiovisual equipment for conferences such as the American Humanist and the American Atheist Conferences. He worked at ABC Television in Hollywood for several years. And uh, the first conference I ever attended was Bruce's Logical Conference, which was at the uh, Four Points Sheraton at LAX a couple of years ago, and uh, really opened up my thinking and my participation in, in many conferences. I learned a lot there and very much appreciate the work he's doing. So with that, Bruce, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, welcome, everybody. This is about the fourth or fifth time I've done this this lecture and I've modified it to update it to new news about Wu and I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot of things. Uh, so one thing I'd like to find out about is if I do uh, make a claim that um, is unsupported, uh, please give me uh, email or chat. We can do it that way. Uh, email is um, bruce at backyardskeptics.com. We're going to talk about these things, conspiracy theories, pseudoscience, non-medical supernatural claims, and that's probably the longest one. Why we believe weird things. It's a good conclusion because there are so many people believing in weird things and there's a natural uh, contendency uh, to do that. And of course, why we was dangerous. A lot of people say, well, why don't we just let people do what they want to? Well, we'll go into that. And how we can tell what is most likely true. And notice how I worded that, not what is true, but what is most likely true, because even science doesn't have 100% truth. So it has evidence that is much more likely to be true, but it's always changing. Uh, some people say that, oh, look, science has been wrong in the past. Yes, but what did replace it? Better science. So fair warning, uh, some viewers might feel uncomfortable with the examinations of currently held belief that you might have. And we'll talk about why we believe that so you can incorporate that into your thinking. Placebos are not free, although they should be. And we can always, uh, we can only know what is true only by investigation, and that's what scientific skepticism is all about. And uh, one thing that I always try to do is examine one's own confirmation bias, because I realize I have my own bias. My wife reminds me all the time. And I'm always curious to find better ways to be more neutral. So what is Wu? Well,
uh, descriptive of an event or person espousing new age theories such as energy work, crystal magic, bizarrely restrictive diets, conspiracy theories, or supernatural paranormal psychic occurrences. And of course, we have to view what we're all talking about here is basic scientific skepticism. Sometimes it's referred to skeptical inquiry as a practical epistemological position in which one questions the veracity of claims lacking imperial evidence. This is a, um, uh, the different topics we're going to be talking about. And uh, first, let's go over conspiracy theories. Everybody knows what a conspiracy theorist is. Uh, theories are uh, conspiracy theories, an explanation of an event or situation that evokes an unwarranted conspiracy, generally one involving illegal or harmful act carried out by a government or other powerful actors. The biggest one, of course, 9-11. There are so many reasons why all the conspiracy theories just totally don't make sense. Uh, uh, it was a remote controlled airplane. The passengers were not on there. The government's taking them. Who killed JFK? Uh, that still is around, not too much anymore. A more recent one is um, chemtrails. Uh, if you don't know what a chemtrails are, this is what they look like if you look up in the sky. And the conspiracy theorists think that it's the government giving us drugs through the air to make us more pacifistic. The problem is that it's making everybody pacifistic, including those who probably designed the chemtrails. There's so many things about that. Another big one besides 9-11 uh, is uh, the moon landing. There's so much evidence now that uh, uh, we know that we landed on the moon. We're probably going to be going back there very shortly. I listened to the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and they're all about the new plans that NASA has of making a orbiting space colony around the moon. Uh, cell phones causes cancer. That was about 15 years ago. And I love this one, alien sex experiments. Don't ask me where I got this picture. It was years ago. Uh, and if the earth was flat, cats would have pushed everything off of it by now. What else would be true if conspiracy theories were true? Well, secrets would be kept by hundreds of thousands uh, who were involved. There's about 40 to 50,000 people involved in NASA and the space uh, and the moon landing. Credible evidence would be indisputable. Um, major and possibly multiple inquiries would be conducted by governments, maybe not this government because it's a conspiracy, but possibly other governments. And here's uh, the reason why people believe in conspiracies, the desire for understanding and certainty, the desire for control and security, the desire to maintain a positive self-image. And what's common among conspiracy theorists? Distrust of authority. You might see a little bit more to, uh, about that in the last four years lack of analytical thinking, feel a lack of control in their life, and want to feel special. Now, more about that later. Uh, the conspiracy theory offers the chance of hidden, important, and immediate knowledge so that the believer can become an expert possessed by a new knowledge not held even by the so-called experts. We're going to be moving on to pseudoscience medical treatments. Pseudoscience consists of statements, beliefs, or practices that are claimed to be both scientific and factual, but are incompatible with, scientific, with the scientific method. Uh, we're going to go through a couple ones right now. This was a couple of the first slides here were borrowed by a speaker that I will remember in a few moments uh, at a Logical conference. And I just, uh, uh, a fair warning, I did borrow some slides from her and she gave me permission. Foot graphology is uh, if you notice that it's only professionals that will put pins or massaging on the parts of the feet. And if you see here, it's kind of top to bottom, brain to uh, colon at the very bottom. So it's roughly related to uh, how our body uh, is formed. Another one is railroad therapy. This one, probably no one has heard of it. It's in India and you put your body on the railroad tracks while a train is coming and the vibrations from the railroad train vibrates your body and heals it in some way. The trick is to get off the tracks before you get run over by the train. Uh, of course, we have crystals. Um, I'm about three miles from Knott's Berry Farm, and you can get some of these crystals for about eight bucks. There's one in the bottom left there that's for 300. Uh, more on this from Gwyneth Paltrow a little bit later. Uh, acupuncture. This is an acupuncture puppet that you wish it's going to be someone that you know and the acupuncturist will kind of tap the body and it's supposed to be related directly to the person that you're hoping that it is mimicking. Uh, kinesiology is also a technique. It's completely useless. 
I use a simple muscle testing procedures to find the problem areas. Uh, this is where the uh, patient here is the woman, the practitioner is the man, and you hold up your hand, and the man basically feels the pressure of the normal uh, resistance. And then you hold something negative, like maybe uh, a type, some type of poison or, or something that you are not agreeable with, and you're supposed to have a much less powerful uh, force. It's very anecdotal by the practitioner, and uh, you can also do it by your dog. Uh, the owner is on the left holding onto the dog. The practitioner is holding onto the patient, and you can see that through the dog, it's transmitting their problems to the human, which is related to the muscle flexation of the hand. And same thing with the daughter here. Even though the practitioner is holding the, the mother's hand, the energy is flowing from the daughter to the mother, and you get the idea. Uh, this was in the 70s. So I remember this very distinctly when I was 18 years old. Uh, Pyramid and Power does absolutely nothing, but it does all of those things that it claims to do. Herbal medicine, I wish I had a larger section on this because I just read a book and it had a lot to do with herbal medicine. Ear handling. Uh, this I just read from the book Trick or Treatment. It's by two doctors in England, a very fascinating book, and gives a lot of detail and history about uh, pseudoscience practicing. The ear handling is supposed to draw out the evil spirits in your ear, or it has, it's a hollow um, candle. Uh, unfortunately, about 20 to 30 people have more earwax after the procedure than before. I kind of found that a little comical. Taping is very rare. We don't really see it that much, but it's supposed to increase your energy levels of your muscles. Uh, this is an interesting one that I just now um, conceded that fish oil should not be on this list. Well, maybe, maybe it should. All of these things are placebo effects, but the fish oil, uh, the studies just come out uh, several, actually just several years ago, that it does help heart uh, patients with their um, heart conditions. Uh, cannabis oil has not proven to do anything except make you feel better, just as if it was a, a drug like uh, morphine or a weaker version of it, of course. Uh, let's look at homeopathy. Homeopathy is a three billion uh, dollar industry, and it actually is just uh, placebo. Uh, I don't know if many people here know what homeopathy really is, but a quick definition of is the idea that like cures like, symptoms can be cured through medicines that create similar symptoms. And the principle of minimal dose, what happens is you take a particular element, let's say lavender, you put it in water, you have to shake it over a particular shoulder, and then you have to bang it against a hard surface to energize the water with the lavender. And this is all for real. You can actually see this happening on YouTube at the uh, procedures and laboratories where these, this is actually done. And you can have a very, very little amount of the actual lavender or whatever the medicine might be in the, the water. And this is how it's made. You put one drop in maybe a gallon or a quart, and you start putting one drop into another quart, another quart, and another quart. And the 4C represents four zeros. So that's 4,000 times less than the original mother tincture. Remedies are so diluted that based on chemistry, it's difficult to find any molecules in the original substance of the remedy. The problem with this is that the more you dilute it, the more powerful it becomes. So as you can see here, this is the dilution up to two million times. This is enough to fill a void between the sun and the earth with a sphere, and you would have one molecule in that sphere of water. That's how weak that particular one is. And I just threw this in here. Sure to get pregnant now. How many illnesses does homeopathy claim to cure? Now, if there's hundreds of illnesses that one particular thing can't claims to cure, that's a big red flag. And I've put an icon for the red flag on some um, of the future slides that I have. And this is one page. There's actually three pages of everything that homeopathy cures. Basically, it's the biggest placebo in the world. People are spending $3 billion on it and more. And I just read two nights ago that France is actually outlawing homeopathic drugs in their country, even though 60% of the people use it in their country. And that's uh, pretty ballsy for a uh, government to do that. Well, let's uh, 
end up with a couple more things about homeopathy, direct physical harm. Some products have toxic contaminants. Indirect physical harm, delay in getting effective care can result in worsening of conditions. And this is true for all of the woo that I'll be talking about. Wasted money, of course, and harm to society uh, when you spread false beliefs that vaccines and prescribed drugs do more harm than good. And $3 billion, we talked about that. This is massage, yoga, chiropractic, homeopathic medicines, and natural products, such as all of the different plant-based. And that equates to more than $30 billion for all of those. Uh, going back to here a little bit, we'll talk more about chiropractic uh, and massage a little bit later. Now we move on to vaccines and autism. This is the map of the amount of diseases that were before the anti-vax movement. And this is the amount afterward. This is about six years later. And we're, I'm sure that a lot of people know about herd immunity. It's uh, the immunity percentage where uh, if a certain amount of people are immune, that means it won't spread. Uh, right now, we're not at herd immunity with COVID-19. Um, COVID and this is a uh, relationship between autism and vaccinations. This is what's called a false cause fallacy. A false cause fallacy is when you take something that you want to prove is true and relate it to something else like organic food sales or uh, something like uh, there's uh, less pirates on the seas based on something. Um, so this is a false cause fallacy. You should not realize that uh, since there is more organic food, uh, food sales and that there is more autism happening. That is not a correct correlation. So why don't parents have their children vaccinated? Well, people get sick when they're vaccinated. Yes, a very, very small percentage do. They haven't been uh, enough research enough. Actually, this is through phase three trials for vaccinations. We're at phase two and three and a couple different vaccinations right now for uh, COVID happening in less than a year when the average is about four years. Uh, it used to be more than 10 years uh, in the early 1900s. The CDC is in cahoots with the vaccine companies. That's a conspiracy theory. The U.S. is special. My kid won't get it. I can't sue for the vaccines companies. That is true, but not too many people really do unless, they're, um, unless they have proof that the vaccines cause something. And the fear of the unknown, that's a real big one. And of course, the cost is negligible for uh, COVID-19 that should be free. Negative outcome of not believing vaccines. In the United States, measles cases reached their worst levels over a decade in the U.S. in 2008. 131 cases, including 15 serious enough to be hospitalized. And the promoters of pseudoscience. Let's take a look at some of those. Everybody knows who Jim Carrey and Jenny McCarthy is. Jenny McCarthy is Jim Carrey's wife. They're probably the number two anti-vaxxers uh, promoters in the country. There's another one that's even greater. Um, by the way, he's a movie actor, she's an ex-playmate, and boy, they must know a lot more than the scientists know. I'm joking there. Uh, here's another science promoter, pseudoscience promoter, Dr. Oz. And here's Dr. Oz in front of Congress, trying to explain that he's starting to promote a little bit too much of the pseudoscience. Uh, here's number one. Oprah's number one because she's done so much to harm people's trust in science. She introduced Dr. Oz, she invented Dr. Phil, who's really not a doctor, and host Jenny McCarthy believes in the secret. I don't know if you know what the secret is, but the secret is that if you have bad feelings, something will harm you. So all those people in the Twin Towers really had bad feelings, and they were bad people, and life is just gonna get the bad people naturally. The richest person from pseudoscience promotion, she sells a uh, sun potion for $55. She has patches. She has a sex dust floor exercise tracker at $200, probably six or $7 from China. Uh, she sells placentia tablets. These are fairly dangerous and a lot of people have gotten sick from them. Uh, I'm not going to even speak the words on this one, but they're $66. And she gets to about a quarter of a million dollars a year from the proceeds from her uh, pseudoscience promotion. But she just paid 145,000, well, maybe, maybe a year and a half ago, $450,000 or so uh, or close for misleading vaginal ache claims. And uh, we're gonna move to naturopathy now. 
a system of alternative medicine based on the theory that diseases can be successfully treated or prevented without the use of drugs by techniques such as the control of diet, exercise, and uh, that should be massage. Sorry about the misspelling. A naturopathic doctor is not a medical doctor. They cannot practice medicine unless they also have an MD. Why is naturopathy so attractive to people? The distrust of real doctors and traditional medicine has grown in this country, especially during the last 10 years or so. Uh, negative effects or real treatments, that's from traditional medicine, not from naturopathy medicine, because naturopathy is mostly uh, a placebo, but it does have some, could have some damaging effects, especially if you don't tell your doctor what her drugs you're taking, because they might conflict with the drug that the doctor will prescribe. And there's people that have uh, not died, but gotten very, very sick and close to dying on this. I think one person did die from the book, uh, Trick or Treatment. I can't remember um, that particular uh, statistic. People who have conditions which are not being successfully treated or which are psychosomatic are more likely to be attracted to the alternative practitioner. This is true, of course, for all practitioners. Are people who use any woo for medical purposes stupid? And this is a valid question. It's like for people who are against woo and have done a little bit of research on it, it's a normal thing to say that maybe the intelligence has something to do with it, but no, it does not. There are some very intelligent people, including doctors. Uh, in fact, I think there's a group of 26 doctors that are saying, take the uh, hydrochloroquine, is that how to pronounce it? To take that. And there's a group of 26 doctors that put uh, some promotional videos on YouTube and YouTube took them down. A friend of mine says, that's proof for me that the government's after them. Of course, you wouldn't believe the 15 or 100,000 doctors that would say, no, you don't supposed to be taking hydrochloroquine against 26 doctors. Who doesn't think about that one? I just heard from a, my son who is a scientist in the, in the pharma industry that if you take this hydrochloroquine at the very beginning of a disease, it can be effective. It might not cure you, but it would make the, uh, the virus less, less, vir less viral. If, it's, if you take it during, the, you've actually had it for a while, it's not effective. That's what I heard, just what you'd like to know. Um, I don't think that's true. I'm open to more studies on it, but I'm believing in all the doctors uh, that I've been listening to that, uh, that I think is false. So let's uh, talk more about that later. Uh, remember, anecdotal evidence from one person is not evidence. Uh, it's just one person. So we have to remember that, especially when uh, there's a slide coming up that I tried it, it worked for me. So remember that slide when it comes up. Uh, placebo effect is produced by a placebo drug or treatment that cannot be attributed to properties of a placebo itself and must therefore be due to the patient's belief in that treatment. I just wanted to clarify that because some people don't know exactly what a placebo is. It's, it's nothing. It's a sugar pill. It has no effect on you, but they use it and, and replace for for a fake replacement, and it looks just like a real pill if you're taking a, a study, of, uh, especially if it's a double-blind study where even the doctor doesn't know uh, which pill he's giving you. Is it a $5 placebo or a $10 placebo? There was a study done years ago where people were included in a study that was no, the study was itself was on placebos. How can you study placebos? Well, you charge them. You charge the patient $5 or $10, and you find out which patient did better. And of course, it's obvious that the $10 placebo, people who took that one or purchased that one, did better than the people who took, purchased the $5 placebo, even though it was actually called a placebo to the patients. And it just boggles my mind how they did that. I don't know how they did that. So I think the blue pill or the red pill in the uh, movies might have something to do with that particular slide. We're going to move on to non-medical miracle claims, and we're going to mention some of my favorite authors of books and uh, favorite anti-pseudoscience investigators. Here is Peter Popoff. I don't know if you remember him in the 1985 faith healing he was doing. He was exposed by James Randi. James Randi is my hero. He was exposed because James Randi went to one of his faith healings, I think it was in Kansas, and he had a friend of his that was a radio specialist, and he got on the radio frequency that his wife was transmitting information from the crowd to Peter Popoff. And so he would say, 
uh, Mary from Oklahoma, you live at this address and you have anxiety attacks and hop up here to the stage. In addition, he would take people that were walking very slowly going into the arena or tent, I think they used to tent most of the time, and he would have the, his staff give the people who were walking with a cane a wheelchair and bring them up on stage, praise to God, and the guy stood up from the wheelchair. And it was just all bogus, and James Randi actually had him on the Johnny Carson show and played back a clip of him uh, with his wife speaking to him through the radio because he recorded it. And remember, this was in the late 70s, early 80s, I believe. So it was quite a feat for him to do that. And uh, James Randi and Carson were close friends, and he came on the show quite a lot. Uh, the next time he came on, he did Psychic, and I think I misspelled Psychic. Judy, did I misspell Psychic on this one? You, uh, you misspelled it, but we know what you mean. <laughs> Please forgive my spelling. So we actually did this uh, performance of Psychic Surgery with an audience member who was laughing the all the time because as you could see his wrist his fingers look like he's in the belly of this person and his fingers are actually going like this into the belly so that's how it's done and if you look very carefully he brings out some chicken guts and there was blood all over the place it was it was actually horrific and this was live television and the only time johnny carson in his entire history of being on tv at the very end said oh shit and of course if you look on the uh, YouTube video, they cut that out, but that's the only time he swore during the entire time. An organization that investigates miracle claims is the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Uh, CFI is a close cousin of them. That's a center for inquiry up in LA. They uh, started in 1976. Uh, CFI started a little bit later. And to counter uncritical acceptance of and support of paranormal claims by both the media and society in general. Uh, James Randy back here. He did a million dollar challenge and he actually had a million dollars cash in the bank with the directions that this person could come and get it, this person being anybody who can prove their, their psychic ability or any other paranormal ability. A million dollars to anybody to demonstrate it. From that point, uh, he doesn't have it anymore because no one got it after 25 years of being on the, on the uh, cusp of being won by uh, psychics and but we do have other people. You can get about $150,000 if you go around the world and pick up all the, the prizes to any type of supernatural ability. This is uh, at CFI parking lot up in Los Angeles. I don't know which one's the dowser. I, I think it's the guy on the left. He's dousing for water. And of course he was unsuccessful. And CFI alone, I think they still have the $50,000. I'm not sure about that, $50,000 reward. And they uh, have an a offshoot called IIG, uh, Independent Investigation Group. And they form the design for the test for anybody who would like to be tested and hopefully get $50,000. Uh, by the way, I'm going to go back to Peter Popoff. Remember, he was the guy with the headset and hidden in his ear. And, and Well, he's back again. He's selling Miracle Water. And he's selling Miracle Water for $40 or $50 a pint. And not only do you get a miracle water, but you also get cash in the mail. And there's, I don't know how they, they got people to say that they got cash in the mail because they never say where they got it from. It was just cash in the mail. So let's go to astrology. Everybody knows about astrology. What do you think of astrology? A lot of rubbish. We Leos aren't fooled that easily. So tarot cards and psychics, fire walking, Fire walking, actually, anybody can do it. There's a reason why you don't get burned. You can look it up. Actually, James Randi did the fire walking as well. Sedona Vortex. I was in Sedona. It's absolutely beautiful. No vortex. Gay conversion therapy. Gay conversion therapy is really a horrible way to try to un-gay people. Um, pray the gay away. And uh, there's also a particular group, I think it was in Seattle or Portland, that had a gray conversion therapy where they would have the guys play football. It was either touch football or I think, yeah, just touch football, and then go to the showers together and all shower together. And now if that's one way to prevent gay therapy, that would just be totally amazing. Uh, supernatural claims, we've already talked about dousing for water. These are other scientific uh, pseudoscience claims. 
And I don't even know what the last one is. Abacoma C. I haven't Googled that one up. And I don't know what empathy, why empathy was listed here. I have no clue either. So maybe somebody can answer me that. Tele, uh, telepathy, that's interesting enough because there are so many people who believe in remote viewing. They could see things remotely as if their mind went somewhere and saw something and related back to them. We're going to GMOs. Very important topic here. There is a scientific consensus that currently available food derived from CM crops poses no greater risk to human health than conventional food, but that each GM food needs to be tested on a case-by-case -case basis before introduction. Nonetheless, members of the public are much less likely than scientists to perceive GMO's foods as safe. Although labeling of GMO products in the marketplace is required in many countries, it is not required by the US and no distinction between marked GMO and non-GMO foods is recognized by the US. This is kind of interesting because it shows to me that the US is on top of things because it's respecting the scientists that do the tests. By the way, 70% of gross fruits are GMO, so it's very hard to get away. Even if you buy a tomato or a pepper or a banana, all of those are GMO now. Examples of GMO foods, a lot of them. And why do we need GMOs? This is very important because uh, GMO foods are sometimes modified only by one nucleotide in the DNA of a plant. You're talking about a GC turning into a, a CG or an AT turning into a TA or, or other. Very, very small, minute amounts of actual um, changes in the, the DNA uh, for these plants. GMO plants use less insecticides. Usually they're better texture and flavor. They conserves water, soil, and energy. Better food yields, nutrition, and longer shelf life. This is very important if you're transporting them from other countries. Animals and plants are more resistant to the disease. Able to add vitamins to plants in areas that need them. Why are people concerned about GMOs? Well, there's a big mistrust of big business. And of course, that is growing. Mistrust of government, mistrust of scientists, which is very odd because the scientists are the only people that have the knowledge to do these tests. Concerned of the unknown, that's just a, a general fear of everybody, I think. A lack of control over the food we eat. Well, you can always grow your own food in your backyard. The bottom line is that GMO uses very small bit of DNA insertion. Humans have been using GMOs for over 6,000 years, but it was a much slower, slower process and much more natural. Uh, the need for food or future populations is very important. This is why we need GMOs. The arable land in the world has been taken. 98% of the arable land, meaning that crops can grow, is taken. And we're not gonna get any more of it. In fact, we're probably gonna be getting less of it due to climate change. So we need GMOs just for those two reasons. Let's move on to why we believe weird things. This is kind of the guts of psychology of this lecture is we want to believe why, I want to believe why people behave certain ways. Is it learned? Is it part of our DNA? Turns out it's a little bit of both. We are impressed by stories. Tell a good story, we might believe that that is true. We see patterns that are not real. This is very true from all the conferences I have videotaped. There's uh, experiments people can do right on the screen in front of a four or 500 person audience and they can be fooled right then and there. We easily jump to conclusions. We're influenced by emotion. We need an answer for unknown things and we make post hoc ergo hero hoc. This is after this, therefore, because of this. Most of us have a belief in agency. We link cause and effect very easily, and it's very difficult to get out of that because we're, we're basically uh, cued into that from nature. If you think that everybody around you believes, it's harder to be a critical thinker. This is cultural bias. If all your friends believe one thing and you believe it, it's much harder to change from the reaction you might get from your friends and family. False cause fallacy, you presume that a real or perceived relationship between things means that one is the cause of the other. Example, pointing to a fancy chart, Roger shows how temperatures have been rising over the past few centuries, while at the same time numbers of pirates have been decreasing. Thus, pirates cool the world and global warming is a hoax. So why woo is dangerous? For all the pseudoscience claims you have seen, the largest risk factor is not knowing 
if it really works. And this is why I put this together, this, this talk. And I really think it's important for people to examining what they're deciding to put in their bodies and how to um, decide on what type of treatment you're going to be having. If it's a serious condition like cancer, one can go from stage one to stage two to stage three, all the while accepting the treatment that is no better than a placebo. Everybody should be concerned about exactly what they're putting in their body, not to mention the monetary loss and the risk using traditional medicine, which is quite often cheaper than holistic or chiropractors or even acupuncture treatments over a period of time. This is the website to find out. Well, what is the harm? Because I talked about that earlier at the beginning. What is the harm of people taking drugs that might just be completely placebo? Well, there might be a placebo, but they might have chemicals in them that might hurt them, especially in conjunction with traditional prescriptions that they might be taking as well. What's the harm has a organized spreadsheet, so to speak, of each, well, here's a sample right here. Uh, I just looked up naturopathy. They have a huge uh, uh, index with about maybe 70 or 80 different types. And you'll see the stories from each of these people. And yes, they're a minority, but I'm sure that there's a lot more that have not been reported. One of the warning signs is that the treatment is not working. This happens a lot in naturopathy and, and some doctors will use the next phrase very narcissistically. For instance, if it becomes painful, if you have stage one cancer and you don't know it and you go to a naturopath, um, more on this a little bit later, as the pain increases, the doctor will say, well, that means the treatment is working. This is so debilitating for a patient who is undergoing a placebo and not getting the correct treatment. This is a red flag. It's imperative that we have trust in traditional medicine. Science-based studies show that alternative medicine is at best a placebo and at worst leads us down the path of self-destruction through confirmation bias. Many more stories, of course, of what's the harm. This is a herbalist that was charged in the death with a 10-year-old boy. And he was a diabetic and instead of insulin, they gave him herbal oils and he started to get painful. And that's exactly what the doctor said when I previously mentioned that the pain is there because the medicine is working. I think he got uh, six months to a year in jail. I forgot what it was, but he did go to a jail, I believe. How can we tell what is more likely true? Do you really want to know what is true? A lot of people like to just live in a bubble and they don't want to know what is true. They don't want to know what is opposite of their own opinion is really what they're trying to say. What are the benefits of knowing if they decide to find out what is true? It promotes better decisions on medical treatments, avoid wasting dollars on treatments that don't work, and avoids more pain and suffering. What is anecdotal evidence? Evidence collected in a casual or informal manner, relying heavily on entirely on personal testimony. It's less likely to be true than empirical evidence. So try to stay away from friends and family that said, it worked for me, because I really, it doesn't matter. Even if it worked for you one time, I'm not going to believe that. Well, I'll put that another way. I believe that you felt more comfortable taking the drug, but I don't believe it had anything to do with reducing the pain and suffering that you might be having. Scientific evidence is evidence which serves to either support or counter a scientific theory or hypothesis. Such evidence is expected to be empirical evidence and interpreted in accordance with the scientific method. The consensus of a majority of scientists in a narrow field of study is most probably true. However, this is something that I learned on the Skeptics Guide. They talked about it for a few minutes. The newer the field is, the less likely it is reliable because they're just starting to find out evidence and they're presenting evidence versus something that's been around for 10, 20, 30 years. So if you have a newer field of study, you have to give a little bit of leeway. Let's say it's less probably true than the consensus of majority of science, a mega study. The mega study is when you have studies upon all the studies. You might have 10 to 20, even 30 studies that have gone on, and you have a mega study on all of those. And those mega studies really show the balance of the truth, whether a medicine is good or how good is it compared to a placebo. So look at mega studies 
And don't look at just one study, especially if you have a very small population. There was a study two years ago at UCLA that they did something with Alzheimer's patients. They, they memorized things better after they gave them this particular drug. And it was 10 patients, and the later the study was debunked. But uh, there was a study on 3,000 people in Europe and America on acupuncture. That's a pretty big study. Science claims are rarely 100% true. As new evidence is presented, the claims become more reliable or change to represent the available evidence. This is how science works. Science doesn't get it right all the time, but they're very rarely entirely incorrect. On more of science claims and evidence, research for the web for English 101 and 102, assessing evidence. So you might be a scientific if you change your mind on an issue if more evidence was presented that conflicts with your current belief. Um, this is very important because you have to be open to that. If you're not open to that, if you have such confirmation bias that you're not even going to look at something that is against your current opinion, then you're not a scientific skeptic. To question supernatural occurrences and non-science-based medical treatments, you discount anecdotal evidence. And this is Snopes, one of my favorite truthful web pages. Well, they do redact things that they get wrong, but it's very, very rare. These guys are basically the fact checkers of the internet. And if you don't know what Snopes is, you gotta look it up and ask it a question or ask it a claim because it has tons of evidence on different types of subjects. I don't have a list. I couldn't find a list on Snopes, but you can search it. Uh, these are several podcasts that I like, and they're also, some of them are actually papers as well. Skeptoid is, is real great. A friend of mine um, has that in, uh, has started that about probably 12 years ago. It's good because it's only 12 to 14 minutes long, and he, he gives a lot of uh, great information, usually in story form. What's the harm? We already went over that. Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is uh, the most popular scientific skeptic podcast. Uh, one uh, that I enjoy is from the BBC, more or less, and another one that is called you are not so smart. It actually is starting to get my favorite one now because they really get down to business. The Skeptics Guide is great, but there's a lot of entertainment in there. I want to get down to the business of science and give me the facts, give me the study, you know, give me the, the conclusion. So science-based medicine is also a great web page to go to. It's actually produced by this guy in the middle of the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. He's, uh, he's the only doctor within that group and there's a lot of other science writers there in that group as well. Here's some other things. Uh, I think I talked to you about independent investigation group that's at the top right, Center for Inquiry, What's the Harm, Conspiracies, uh, Declassified as a Book, Skeptoid, uh, and this is a homeopathic critic. And of course, back here at Skeptics has some news on there as well. And let's open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. And uh, I was very interested, Bruce, in your bio um, where it said that you've placed over 14 billboards. Can you tell us a little bit about your billboards and where we might have seen them? Well, it was mostly in Orange County. It was mostly just to produce secularism and um, atheism. I had two that were, were noteworthy and they got some press. One of them was uh, near Valentine's Day. It had a picture of a couple under a blanket, you saw two small feet and two big feet under a blanket. And the caption read, atheists are make better lovers. It's because we know no one is watching. And that was great. In fact, I went over there one day to take a picture and people were stopping off Beach Boulevard. That's where it was off Beach Boulevard and Garden Grove Boulevard and taking pictures of it, which I thought was very cute. And whatever so, gave you the idea of doing that and how did you raise the funds for doing those billboards? I had a very eccentric atheist from Huntington Beach who was a millionaire living in a mobile home and had a 15-year-old apple with a modem. Mm. That's how eccentric he was. And he wanted to get more press, and I was not getting enough press for him. Uh, thank goodness <laughs> for him that uh, he gave me some money to put up the billboards. And that was really fun. That was a really fun project. I so, made nothing of uh, those. I have a... I have a question. When you talk about conspiracy theories, some conspiracies are real. And I remember growing up in the 70s and hearing stories about the CIA overthrowing governments and torturing and murdering people. And people treated that, oh, yeah, that's just some wacky thing. And then 
Senator Frank Church held hearings and found out that in fact those things were real. Uh, could you say something about that? Sure, Robert. Yes, um, you know those secret government projects. I don't believe much of what they say a lot of the times either because in the past they've hidden it so well but in the future it does come out it's a it's a conspiracy that turns out to be true but only because somebody let the, the word out and have some facts and evidence behind it for instance you can't say the same thing for the moon landing was fake because nobody's come out on that does that make sense robert yeah but there's a problem so Senator Frank Church was able to do that investigation and then he was ousted from office and the message was pretty clear that um, it was not politically safe to do that. And, and when Reagan did the Iran-Contra conspiracy, which was also real, uh, right. the result was that laws were passed that made it illegal to reveal of those conspiracies, even if laws were being broken. So it does get kind of difficult to reveal this information. Um, this is a real problem. Yeah, I know, Robert, there's a, uh, a professor at a university in Florida. I listened to him at, I think, the PsychCon and uh, Joe Yushinsky. And uh, one of his comments was, you know, one of the great difficulties with conspiracy theorists is that sometimes conspiracies are true. They, they really do exist. Um, uh, and then that obfuscates all the conspiracy theorists who are, you know, coming up with explanations of things that they don't understand and seeing conspiracies where there aren't any. Yeah, so well, think, it's like a valid to, point. There are such things as conspiracies. Yes, sir, it is a valid yeah, point. I'd like to hear Bruce Gleason's response to this. Oh, I totally agree with Judy. Uh, I, I feel that truth eventually comes out. It might take decades for it to come out, especially with political issues. But uh, I'm sure that aliens aren't kidnapping people and impregnating them with alien children. So uh, it also depends on what's more possible. Uh, you know, is, it, is the earth flat? Probably not. Uh, did the government screw up and do something behind our back? Much more feasible. Oh, Marianne, Marianne? Marty. Yeah. Uh, talk, talk about supplements for memory like Prevagen. Well, I don't believe in Prevagen uh, because I see that it's a marketing ploy and I'd like to see the studies of it. Uh, I don't believe in anything unless I take a look at the studies. So it actually could be real, but the study has to be independent. It can't be under the Prevagen uh, label at all. It has to be totally independent. And one study doesn't do it for me because you never know what study could be. If you look at acupuncture studies, about 30% of them uh, are say that acupuncture works and all of those 30 are from China. <laughs> so I really need to study it a little bit more to find out if memory is correct uh, by taking drugs. And uh, one thing that has improved memory is healthy living, healthy eating and exercise and reading and intellectual study. That actually has an effect that's provable. So um, uh, I have the Alzheimer's drug. Well, what was your name again? I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm an unsuccessful comedian. And my whole family has it. So I'm taking the best reason uh, approach to it. And it turns out that carbohydrates, anything that has sugar in it, even fruit sometimes, is harmful to uh, getting Alzheimer's earlier than you would. I'm still gonna get it probably, but carbohydrates has a big part in it. So cut out your sugar diet and you, if you have the Alzheimer's APOE 3-4 um, or 4-4 four, four, uh, sequence, and uh, you'll live longer before you get Alzheimer's. There, but there's Alzheimer's is just extremely complicated. Hi, sorry, got here late. Um, I heard, and one of those science-based medicine websites, or whichever one it was, that uh, Prevagen, the company, uh, had to pay some millions of dollars for making false claims. So a significant amount of the claims Prevagen people are making are false. Um, I was going to say that the IE, IIG 
uh, has uh, increased the prize for proof of the paranormal to 250,000. And on a personal note, my cousin went to a naturopath who told them they had something called adrenal fatigue. So this is like a real world example of a naturopath harming someone. They've got some mental problems and a husband who drinks a little too much. But they were told they had that they were tired and depressed because they had adrenal fatigue, which is a thing that naturopaths um, um, diagnose uh, based on the amount of um, stress hormones in your saliva. And then you read about it, it you find that the amount of stress hormones in your saliva vary wildly over the days. So depending on when you take the saliva test, it's going to have a different reading depending on whether you've seen some good food and your saliva is flowing fast or slow it's going to change it's just not a reliable test for for anything related to adrenaline mm -hmm. and that's um and i wish i had a question for bruce but i'll let the next person speak hey bruce uh, on that prevagen question or any of these which of those websites would be a good place to look would snopes have something about prevagen or well, I just looked up test. right here. This is uh, for, I just looked up Prevagen, Prevagen uh, lawsuit, and it was sold through misleading advertising and memory loss. So that pretty much concludes it for me. Mm. Because if it was real, it wouldn't even be getting any close to this, anything close to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so just look up. This is uh, ARP from ARP. ARP is a big organization, so that's another big plus for the review negative review. Yeah, AARP looking out for their uh, their members who are disproportionately right. hit by. Right, um, because if it was if it was absolutely true that it improved it, uh, they wouldn't have any problem with the claims. But they have, have to have evidence, and it has to be impartial evidence, and it should be one uh, more than one study as well. Are there any other questions? Yeah, as far as the Prevagen, I I would also recommend the Science Based Medicine website. Um, I don't know if they address Prevagen, but they have many articles and information about supplements and drugs and, you know, medical treatment. So that would be another good place to look for that. By the way, this is uh, the person that I uh, referenced to in the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, the doctor. He is part of the science-based medicine crew. So um, he is a, the, one of the top scientific skeptics in the world as well. So I would be more likely to believe him than, than anyone promoting a drug. Anthony, you had a question? Um, so I was actually uh, curious as to what um, our host Bruce may think of psychedelics and their use in medical treatments. That's a really good question. Man, I had LSD in my, in my uh, teens and wow, it was great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, I was privileged to have good trips. Uh, only took it twice and both were very memorable. But I have heard uh, through some of the podcasts that there has been some positive effects from it in low doses. Uh, I do, do not remember exactly what the study was, but I think that it had to do with people that were very depressed. I'm not sure about that. Uh, don't quote me on that. And It'd be very interesting to find out more information on that. We're finding out that some of the drugs that were more uh, under the entertainment label and experience label uh, are coming back into favor by having people treated and improved on some of those drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think because uh, especially in light of new recent evidence from different universities and scientific studies, it seems that uh, psychedelics are really starting to see a comeback in terms of medical usage. I may, um, if, 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 I, if uh, you want, I may even um, link an article in the chat, which is a uh, meta-analysis of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, which is basically a therapy method in which... Um, treatment patients were given um, ketamine and psilocybin and LSD in high doses um, in conjunction to psychotherapy. And they saw a radical improvements in things such as PTSD, depression, existential anxiety, and even substance abuse. 
Yeah, I certainly have heard uh, similar things, Anthony, about um, how those psychedelics were initially uh, demonized, and yet there may be some medical benefits in certain circumstances. It sounds like an exciting area of, um, of neuroscience medicine. Also, I think that 60 Minutes just did a program about two months ago. I think it was not LSD, but I think it was psilocybin. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it, it improved people's health quite a bit. One heavy duty trip, and they didn't take it consistently just one time. And yeah. it was documented very well. And uh, I, I thought that was great. The object is, is to have people lead happier lives. And if you can do that through psychedelic uh, uh, drugs, that's totally fine with me. It's the idea of living a good life and, and having the best uh, treatment you can for a particular uh, problem. Uh, yeah, this is a simple question. You had commented about acupuncture, and I think I missed the points you were making. Could you repeat your thoughts about using acupuncture? I'll do that with a study that I read about that happened in the U.S. and the, and the uh, Europe, mostly in Europe, it was a 3,000 person study over a four year period. Uh, and what they did was they, they worked very well because how are you going to test acupuncture with needles? You can't do no needles because you have to have something that represents needles but is not a needle. So they took 1,000 people and they had them under real acupuncturist um, treatment. And then a second thousand had a real acupuncturists, but they had wooden needles, and the wooden needles were in these flasks that you couldn't see that they were wood. And when they put the electrical wire, a clip to the wire, of course, they didn't do anything. You just got a prick. So that was the control. And that third one they put in, I don't know why they did it for kicks, but they wanted to completely do something different. They hired actors to pose as doctors to another thousand people, and they used real needles poking the patients anywhere they wanted, randomly. Of those three groups, the actors did better. Now, that's a huge amount of people. You have 3,000 people, and 80% of them are saying, yeah, the third, the, the, my doctor was great, and that doctor was a fake doctor. And the reason is, is because the actors uh, were more personable, possibly, than clinical, like the real doctors might have been. But if you go into a nice room at the uh, chiropractor, the massagist, the massage therapist, acupuncturist, and they're low light, and there's light music playing, and it's a, maybe there's some, a nice flavor, some flowers around, and the doctor talks to you nicely, and you trust the doctor, that is a pretty big placebo, those four things happening all at one time, and the belief that you have a good doctor that's going to be representing your treatment. Does that make sense, Jules? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> now, chiropractic, I've just learned, does have some benefits. I was totally against it before, but for neck and back pain, it actually has a small, small increase over the placebo. But there's so many things that can happen negatively on a chiropractor. So I hope that, I know it's, it's painful to say that chiropractors don't do any good because there's so many people that swear by their chiropractor. But another red flag is you look at the history of acupuncture and chiropractic and, and herbal medicines, take a look at the history of things. Acupuncture actually has three different versions of maps of the body. So depending if you go to one chiropractor or another, you're gonna be hit with needles in a totally different place. This is, this is like going to a doctor and having three medicines that the doctor doesn't even know about the other two. Hey Bruce, um... Can you tell us about your conferences? When do you think you're going to have Logical and uh, your other conference again? Well, do you have any thoughts on that? We've been, as a humanist and science community, we've been bombarded by all of these Zooms with great speakers from all over the U.S. And there's really no room for me to have a Logical on Zoom. So it's probably going to be next year. Uh, Logical is going to be my next conference. Um, it's, it's open to more people, uh, even though the scientific skeptics and the atheists are very, very close together uh, in, uh, in uniformity of beliefs, that um, uh, it's, it's fascinating to be part of that community because, first of all, I get corrected all the time of the nuances that if I make a mistake or if I'm wrong about a particular fact, I have to go back and change things. And Okay, thank you. 
Well, um, we appreciate, this is how we clap, we appreciate you coming and talking to us. Um, I appreciate all the work that you've done, the leadership you've provided in the Skeptics and Free Thought community, the billboards you've put up, and um, thank you for attending. <laughs>